Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Mayor's Table. With me today is Farmington Electric Utility Director Hank Adair. We're going to be talking about energy, things that are important to you and I. What's happening here locally with some of the outages we've seen here during the summertime? What's going on in California in the electric grid and the price for energy here in the western part of the United States? How is that affecting us and what are we doing about it to make sure that we're protecting your interests for affordable, reliable power? everyone, Farmington Mayor Nate Duckett, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Mayor's Table. With me today is our dear friend, Hank Adair, the Farmington Electric Utility Director. Hank, thanks for joining with us. Glad to be here. Excited to be. Well, it's, it's timely, this discussion, and I know you've recently done a presentation to the City Council uh, regarding a few things uh, for Farmington Electric Utility. Specifically in that presentation, which we want to get into today a little bit, it's about the reliability of our grid. Uh, we've had some outages here over the, the summer months, and anytime there's an outage, along with everything else that's happening kind of globally in energy and different threats for brownouts and blackouts, people want to know what's going on. So it's very timely that you're here. I also think today would be a good time to talk about what is happening here, maybe western part of the United States, specifically as we see California uh, calling for rolling blackouts, giving out $10 gift cards to people to not use power between the, mm -hmm. the times of 4 and 9 p.m. I mean, don't charge your electric vehicle. Yeah, right? yeah. we're not going to sell uh, gas vehicles you know, past 2035, but please don't charge your electric vehicles tonight. Uh, absurdities that we're seeing in, in that. And, I, and, so, and, and I, Hank, you know this. I mean, I, I have a, a Saturday radio show, and I, I'll be honest with you. It almost seems like every single show we end up 50% of the time talking about energy mm -hmm. because that's how important it is, certainly to me, Obviously to you, my co-host on the radio show, Sean, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time talking about it because it's so important to everything we do in our lives. It's everything in our lives. The Internet of Things is a real, live, living, breathing animal in our homes, right? Anytime Absolutely. the power goes out, it's a life-changing experience. It's much different than it was two decades ago. Completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've thought about this, and we, we've, I, I think about this all the time. I mean, there, there should be some standard core principles that every elected official should have. Um, and one of those core principles is I, I, I promise to maintain a stable, affordable, reliable energy grid. That That is a mandatory component. Mm -hmm. Just like I will work to make sure that we have clean water <laughs> for, <laughs> for our people to drink. Or I want to provide safe communities for kids to go to school and play in parks and mm -hmm. so you can go out at night and not be afraid. Like there's some core components, but energy, because we have to pay for that, everybody has to pay for that. The companies who are manufacturing every product that we that we use on everything in this room had to come from a power from a plant that was using power that came from some form of electron that was produced in some way, shape or form, um, to every every bit of food that we eat. Mm -hmm. It requires energy to harvest that food, to grow that food. So it is built into the cost of our, of our entire lifestyle. And what we've seen happening here over the past few years, frankly, is frightening. Um, and what we're seeing happening in Europe right now, the cost of energy in Europe because of what's transpired uh, with their energy policies and, of course, their reliance on Russian gas is, is horrifying. Mm -hmm. The things that are happening in California, the policies that have been, you know, obviously adopted there that – that I believe are, are going to find their way to New Mexico, um, which we, we can talk about later on as we discuss San Juan Generating Station, but th these people are not telling the truth about the realities of what's going to transpire. Mm -hmm. So, And you're seeing it day over day, Mary, even at the federal level, at the Energy Regulate Regulatory Commission at the federal level, they're saying the more and more the state mandates and the variability of our resources is going to lead to more loss of load events, and that's a special term they use in the electrical world, but Things are getting more challenging every day, the more variability we have. And every day it gets worse and worse. I just, it, it, it boggles my mind. But Farm Channel Electric Utility, we have a great track record of reliability. We um, do. Certainly affordability has been a component of what our mission has been for a long time. We want to continue to be that to the best of our ability, but there are certain you know, outside forces that are going to impact 
what we may deem as uh, affordability. But first, I want to get into the reliability. Mm -hmm. Talk about what's been going on this summer with you know the, the outages, and really maybe put a number to what those outages mean to a person here in this community when the power goes off. Um, some people get this idea that it's happening a lot, it's happening all the time, or that it's on purpose. Sure. Uh, and I'll start out with what's been happening lately. You know, I am so happy that we have had a monsoon season this oh, year. Yes. I mean, it is a, a major August benefit. was incredible. It was an incredible uh, time frame, but it had an effect on our utility system because when you see the storms come, you see the wind come with it, right? Often you'll see those heavy winds. And my gosh, this early spring, we had some major winds. I've, those were some of the largest winds or heavy velocity, you know, winds I've ever seen here, living Absolutely. here my whole life. And so we really stress the system related to trees, and trees are one of our largest outage components. And so we were managing through the trees, cutting them down when they were falling on lines. And we actually have a really good process where we do tree trimming, and we have contractor tree trimmers that do that. And so that was a really big effect. Lightning strikes hit us a lot this year. We had a lot of lightning strikes. One that hit us here in Cottonwood on our Cottonwood um, substation that's here in the in the uh, center part of the city of Farmington. But we actually had a lot of lightning strikes and a lot of things happen. Some to the south in Nappy and, and a lot to the east, east of, let's say, Aztec. And it seems like, yeah, yeah. that, that area has gotten a lot more of the, the heavier storms maybe than we have. Bluntly, they got hammered. Yeah. And so even when you see outages like that, when we have an outage Mayor, what we do often is we don't just turn the power back on and see what happens. Maybe whatever happened disappeared. If a full circuit trips, we have the philosophy in our utility of what is that line in somebody's family's backyard? We don't want to power it back up and see what happens. So we're always out patrolling the lines, and those takes time for us to drive down the lines, inspect them. When you have events like that, for example, the washes were running so high east of Aztec that we couldn't even get across washes. We had to wait or find alternate routes to even patrol the lines. But our crews are out there in the middle in the heat of that battle doing what's right to protect our customers and get that power on as quick as we possibly can. Now, other than the weather, we've had some outages too that have been related to animals. And animals, I would say, other than trees, our, our biggest issue is animals, and it's birds mostly. We do have a luxury we're not the southeast part of the United States. We don't have a lot of squirrel issues. Squirrels are a national issue related to power, but we don't have a lot of squirrels. Ours are ground squirrels, and literally right. they like the ground. They're very different here, which is funny. Growing up in Denver, we had a lot of those squirrels climbing those balls, mm -hmm. and we, don't, we just don't see that here. No. Just 300 miles south we just it's the nature of our habitat and what we have for animals here yeah. but we do have a lot of birds amazingly enough and we have a lot of bird impacts and so we actually had a bird get between two switches a switch i'm sorry which ties two lines together and he touched both sides of those lines and it caused a fall and that happened which caused a very large outage here in this you know in june okay and what happened is is when that fault happened it was really close to our substation and it was thousands of amps of fault that's that's what they call a fault is they measured it in amps and actually our substation tripped off because we actually seen fault currents that could have damaged the transformer and in today's day and age you know a brand new transformer would take us two months not two months two years to get and they're very very expensive are you kidding me Hank? two years two years to get a new transformer of the size we're talking a substantial wow. and so we have backup plans for that we have mobile subs we oh, can move around so yeah. we already have got contingency plans so we can manage if a transformer were to fail we have two mobile subs or and that's what the slang we call for them but you want to protect that very expensive very long-term equipment and so even though we had a short outage because of it on a patrol we still had to do all of that and everything worked the way it should have because we didn't want to damage that transformer so all our protections work the way it is so that's generally the process we've had some issues related to weather related to animals and, and we're working to correct those and we have a lot of things we're doing to improve if you will for outages one is for example those switches let's redesign it so there's a bigger clearance than a bird's wingspan we can redesign some of our processes also in the short term just like you have insulation on your extension cord at your home we mm -hmm. can put insulation and cover up um, what they could be setting up what that could be setting up and so that's a key piece of a Another thing we're doing is called pole testing, and that's where we actually go out to every pole in our system. And we've tested 32,000 of our 52,000 poles right now. And we go to the base of the pole and we drill it. And if 
the wood is very good, then it's hard to drill through. If the wood has become rotten, it's soft, and you, you'll drill through it much easier. And they actually have a test that they can do as they drill through those poles to say, hey, this one's in good shape. Hey, this one needs to be replaced in the future. Hey, this one imminently has some problems. You ought to replace it now. That increases the reliability of our system. At the same time, we're doing a thing called advanced metering infrastructure, and we've installed like 16,000 meters of the 45,000. And those even, a uh, customer doesn't even have to call us to say, hey, we have an outage. Those meters tell us when there's an outage, and it looks at multiple meters if they're all out in a cluster, and it tells our linemen, go to this location and start troubleshooting here. It actually starts to troubleshoot the problem, which gets us back online quicker. So I rambled a little bit. Mayor, go ahead. No, no, no. It's, it's interesting that the, where you know, technology is leading us mm -hmm. to have that real time from the home. Mm -hmm. um, and as I understand, those advanced meters, too, will also allow the customer to be able to see how much power they're using at any given time Absolutely. and help control, you know, maybe they're so they don't, you know, hit, hit peak power times and things of that nature. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, they allow us to change our rates to time of use and things like that in the future to help shave our peak. But it also helps the customer be able to see what their load is at any given time. And then they can work on things like energy efficiency, one, that help their bill, and two, help the grid out. Great. In regards to what our percentage of reliability is, I, mean, I think at mm -hmm. one point you've told me it's like 99 point something percent. And what that is, is taking every second of every minute of every hour of every day yeah. and saying, here's how, and then how many of those seconds, minutes, and hours we've actually been offline. That's it. What does that percentage look like now after this, this summer? Even with everything we've had go on this summer, Mayor, our reliability or how much we're available is 99.98%. That's pretty incredible. That's better than, oh, it's, it's very good. It's better than the national average for public power and significantly better than IOUs, investor-owned utilities, and cooperatives combined. So we're, we're, we're doing much better than the national average. I would say a ratio, I know you know that movie Rent or the musical Rent, right? They say 525,600 minutes, right? Yep. Basically, each customer on average in our system is off 106 minutes only of that 525,000 minutes in a given year. About That's an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, something like that. Hour and 45 minutes yep. in 8,760 8, hours. So pretty that's, reliable. That's pretty good. And I, I mean, I, growing up in Denver, uh, just reflecting on as a child, I remember we had a closet that has a specific section of candles uh, that we accessed because I, mean, I remember power going out, I want to say frequently, but mm -hmm. enough that we needed to have candles and flashlights available to us. We don't have that in our house. You don't have a backup plan here, right? Because you don't need it. I mean, it. I need that backup plan probably, but, mm -hmm. but that's just not been my experience. And I think we feel very comfortable uh, knowing that, you know, farm to electric utility when we've had power outages has been very quick to respond to that is hank you know mm -hmm. this past summer i i was witness to a fire catching at one of our <laughs> a, a, where we had just put in some new lines we, yeah um her you know a friend called me said you hear this buzzing going on and i show up and there's this buzzing and then there's this thing that happens but as quick as they responded to that uh to make sure that they got those customers back online i mean it was just a really just it was less than an hour yeah and we have to understand that things do happen that are outside of our control. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've had comments for people who hate the way the trees get cut. Well, around the, the power lines, well, they, they, we cut them this weird way to try and, you know, extend a, we don't want to have to go back every single year to address that tree. Um, but two, we got to keep them away from those lines. Otherwise we're going to have those outages that cause people problems in their lives. It's, it's a very hard balance with tree trimming, Mayor, and you're spot on. And when you think we have over 2,000, you know, well over 2,000 miles of line, it's hard to get back to that same pole in that cycle. There's just so much line for us to manage. Now, obviously, we focus on where our large outage components are, which circuits have a lot of tree outages, and we really focus on them more. You want to work on your largest risk first, right? And then work your way through the process. But yeah, it's a challenge every year with it. You got to trim them to keep the reliability, but sometimes they don't look the prettiest when you do it. Right. So what is really important in this conversation, obviously, this is this is good information for people to have, is that none of these outages have been planned. None of these are what we are what everybody's starting to understand those kind of hot topic words of brownouts and blackouts. Nothing that has occurred has anything to do with a planned brown or blackout, right? Not whatsoever. There was, when we would post on outages or we would see posting on 
Facebook or social media in the area, some people said, oh, I think this is all the rolling brownouts. That is not the case, not by a mile. We did not want those outages to happen, and we're working hard to even make them happen, you know, even less. But if we were to truly do a rolling brownout or something like that, there's are things called energy emergency alerts that are required, and there's processes for it, right? Just like you've seen California doing those notifications at various levels. It's like, hey, do I have enough power for today? Hey, I don't have enough power today with my spending reserves. And hey, we need to talk about conservation and things that may happen in rolling. So the utility, if Farmington was to do that, Farmington Electric, we would give notifications to say, hey, we're getting in in a challenged mode for next for tomorrow let's say and things like that just like you're hearing out of california seeing in the news we would make those notifications say help, please help us conserve some energy at this time and we've never been anywhere near that now don't get me wrong we're still purchasing power on the market because we don't have enough power that we can make ourselves right now and it's very very expensive but it's the same as i've said previously it's still available it's just very expensive at this time Sooner or later, there may be an extreme event happens, things like that happen, fires and transmission lines and things, but we'll notify our customers well before we'll be doing that, that would be initiated by the utility. Well, it's interesting to know, and I, I think it's, it's a good you know, kind of segue for people to find out information regarding um, outages. And you know, I'll get text messages at times when outages happen in certain neighborhoods, uh, phone calls, emails, those, those things. Your group, as soon as there's an outage, is pretty Johnny on the spot mm -hmm. and putting out onto social media, um, posting on the web page, which also follows social media. But you're pretty good about saying, hey, we're aware of an outage. It's in this area. You know, we are responding to it. No ETA to have the power back up. Mm -hmm. And then if people are tuned into that, then, of course, they can stay apprised. Is there any other place that you... If they call into electric utility, obviously, I believe that the answering machine will say we're aware of an outage. Is there yeah. any other places you would advise people to stay up to date? I think those are the biggest ones. One is social media and our Facebook postings. The other is we have an outage map. And oftentimes people can go and look and they'll even, independent of Facebook, if they're not liking the Facebook approach, you can actually click on an outage map. And that outage map will show where we have outages. And it may not even be an entire circuit outage. There may be an outage today that caused a fuse to blow and only two or three customers are out, for example. You can see those on there. I think those are the two best locations I'd recommend. And oftentimes you'll see, and sometimes we don't know the outage caused right off the bat. We have to go out there and patrol. But we like to even tell people why we had the outage, a story, if you will. Obviously, if there was an accident, we got to protect personal information, things like that. But yeah. we like to tell the story of what happens out there, absolutely. So that's good. So no brownouts, no blackouts that have been planned. But I certainly, Hank, I, I share probably, you know, similar concern with many of the people really across the world right now. Um, and concerns about the movement, the, po the policies that have, have now forced, mandated, unreliable, renewable energy to be adopted um, in so many places without proper backup power. And when we, we say backup power in regards to renewables, that's natural gas power uh, for the most part. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. to have firm, dispatchable, yeah. and dispatchable means that when you need it, you can turn it on and it's going to be there. And ramp it up or down and if you have it on. Ramp it up or down. Mm -hmm. Nuclear is a, a another example of that. Nuclear, normally you can run it you know, full time, full bore. Up to base load and then hold there, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and coal, of course, has been on the outs for a decade now. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for communities like ours who you know, really rely upon that industry and recognize the value of affordable, reliable power. And, and so looking at what the costs are associated right now, and maybe you can explain to us you know, what a megawatt hour is or, or different things to help us understand. But as I remember, San Juan Generating Station, um, we were somewhere around 36 to $38 mm -hmm. dollars per megawatt hour was the cost right now in California today? It's in the three hundred, four hundred dollar range, right? Uh, and even Probably. here locally, right, Mayor? So, so yeah, that's yeah, a, break that down because that yeah, does that affects right us. now. We the power we're buying right is not thirty six dollars per hour or no, per megawatt not. hour. Absolutely, and we're not in California; we're in New Mexico. 
And so I think one of the luxuries we have, Mayor, and it's a, it's a benefit that we have that we're managed and directed, you know, locally by you all as council and advisement by the utility commission, but your direction as council sets the course for this utility. And being public power is such a great thing. We're not governed by renewable portfolio standards in the state right now. That's investor owns and co-ops. Same thing happening in California. But the grid's tied together. So when there's a suck of demand, let's just say, California is buying or importing power from all over the West right now. And so that supply and demand, just standard economics, drives prices up. And so even locally, because of the California and how it's being managed and what the market looks like based on that demand out of California, we bought power yesterday at $304 a megawatt hour. Now, what a megawatt hour means is, you know, if you look, the average residential home uses 600 kilowatt hours in a given month. And so basically you can look at it and just do the math and just double it and say about two homes whole month worth of power of consumption is about a megawatt hour of consumption. So if you do that math and that megawatt hour for a couple homes to power their homes for a whole month um, basically is what you're looking at. And that's normally where we at. It's like we buy in bulk, right? As a utility, right. we buy in bulk, but we sell at a much smaller level. We sell to customers at a kilowatt hour but we buy at the megawatt hour. Historically, for years, this utility has bought power and it's averaged about $40 a megawatt hour to buy it for many, many years. But over the last couple years, it has drastically been more dynamic and it's drastically become more expensive. So we need to manage that. You talked about the coal plant, San Juan coal plant. Right now, I looked at what we paid, what we call bus bar cost, and you were spot on, Mayor. That was $36 a megawatt hour for the month of July for our expenses. Buying at 300, making at 36, that has a drastic effect on our customers. And anything we buy either affects our cash reserves or we have to pass it on to our customers. And we look at things called the power cost adjustment. Now you need to be careful you're not reactionary on two bad, two crazy days in the world, but you need to prepare for those two crazy days. But that's what we're looking at even long term in our integrated resource plan is. We're saying the market is getting more dynamic and we need to own more generation that's under our control than be at risk of the market. Whether San Juan continues or not, we need to have and chart our own destiny more than we do right now and rely on the market today because it's just too dynamic. And ripple effects from Texas or California or ripple effects like Winter Storm Uri out of Texas, those ripple effect right to the Farmington and FUS and our customers. So we need a buffer for the storm of how other states are mandating their utilities. You mentioned just this, the concept of supply and demand, which is pretty easy for, for people to understand. The supply has declined dramatically, dramatically. over the past decade it, uh, on the Western grid. I mean, it if has. California is now, because they're having to buy power coming from outside of their own state, mm -hmm. even though California is the fifth largest economy in the world and has more natural resources to produce energy than than probably any other state in the union. Mm -hmm. uh, they're having to buy power from outside of their state because of their policies, which is driving up costs for everybody else who's buying power on that grid. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we purchase power. Tell, well, just tell us, where do we purchase power from? Obviously, we break it down. We produce power from Bluffview. Mm -hmm. We produce power from San Juan Generating Station, which is, that's, you know, very dynamic at this moment. Right. Navajo uh, Dam mm -hmm. uh, for our hydropower. Those are kind of our three owned. Those are our three and that we own and control. 43 megawatts comes out of San Juan Generating Station. Correct. 63 uh, out of Bluffy. 63. And we get run of the river from Navajo, which its peak, if they're running about 1,200 CFS of flow through Navajo, is about 32 megawatts. But on average, it's much lower. It's normally, I would say, in the 16 megawatt range, about half of its capacity on average. Okay. So if we said 16, 43... And 63, I mean, that's it's over 100, 120-ish. Yeah, we're in that range. What is our peak use in the middle of the summer? Peak use in the middle of summer is about 184 megawatts. So okay. in that given so we day, got a gap there. we have a gap. Okay. We need to fill in that gap. Where do, where do we fill it in at? Right now, we fill it in by purchasing power day ahead. We buy power. There's a certain market where you can buy power for tomorrow based on today and you buy it every morning and we buy it day ahead either from western area power authority or we have three or four other companies we normally deal with and obviously we look at pricing and compare them it's like doing a bid every single day and we find the best power 
that can supply us and match the shape, right? Every day we know what our load's going to look like. So our day ahead schedule looks at his resources, he looks at his gap, and then he fills in that shape, as we call it, of what we think the demand for the next day is going to be. That day ahead scheduler then leaves a little bit of a gap, and then our real-time system operator, because pricing could be better or worse, we hedge a little bit, that real-time operator that's running the grid down there is still buying and selling, not selling, mostly just buying power every single day to fill in that gap. And we use those same, same group of people every single day. But their resources are getting less and less, and they get more constrained, and as there's less and less, and there's more opportunity in the market, then that drives prices. And it just doesn't have to be California every day. That's a perfect example. California sure, and the heat, because sure. we're, we're hot today too, right? Yes, we are. Our load's going to be higher than its normal September this afternoon, because we're going to be in the mid-90s today. Right. So, so, I mean, these kind of things, and, and you pointed out just here as a small municipal-owned electric utility, the desire for us to control our own destiny means that we need to have our own ability to produce our own power for our customers. That's it's, correct. It's cleaner that way for us. It's it's more affordable. You know, obviously there's the uh, there's the upfront cost that you're going to have to get your return on investment on over a period of time. Right. Um, but this also goes down to individuals who are putting solar panels on their home. You mm -hmm. know, they also want to have that type of control and not have to deal with the everyday ups and downs of. Well, I, they don't deal with the everyday ups and downs of the we, cost. It's we really deal you with do. It. Right. It's more on the monthly basis, looking at their their energy bill. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think I saw a video the other day of somebody in California charging their Tesla with a, a generator, and I've had people here ask me, you know, do I, do I need to go buy a generator? Well, I'm, you know, I'm in risk management, so look, a, a generator to me is is you're, you're hedging against risk. So, right. yes, if you went and bought a generator, you would have that peace of mind to know that hey, I'm mm -hmm. going to have the ability to see myself through, you know, a potential, uh, you know, losing power at my home. Right. But people are going to start taking those things into their own, you know making their own decisions about whether or not they want to be paying that price. Mm -hmm. And right now in Europe, I mean, the UK has said, we're going to put a cap on on your energy bill at $2,500. If, if any business, a small business has to pay $2,500 for their energy, let alone a household, yeah, I mean, you can't afford that. You can, that and your home and your payments and everything else that goes with it. That, That's more than your mortgage. That prices you out. It's higher than your mortgage, exactly, for most, most families that would We don't be want to be there, Hank. Mm -mm. And I think that's so. What are right, we doing, right? So I think that's the right balance. We need a we need to build our own generation. That's a piece of it. Now, we might also do some PPAs, right? If somebody's willing to build bigger and it gives us a cheaper price, we're going to look at all those options. But core of it, we still got to have some generation we own, operate, manage, and adjust to match what the load is. Then we go to the market or go out for long-term agreements and partner with people. That's an opportunity, especially if we look at other things like renewables. It's better to do it in bulk and have somebody else do it. I still think we need a little bit of solar, maybe a very small percentage in our system that we own and manage just so we know it, manage it, allows us to do different rates. But bottom line, thermal is where we need to be with a large portion of it. It's our bridge right now. Thermal being? Thermal being gas. Gas. Gas generation, okay. which will drastically reduce our carbon footprint. If you look at our integrated resource plan, we need to build between 90 to 100 megawatts of generation, whether San Juan continues or not, based on that volatility of the market we just talked about. And a very large portion of it will be in gas generation. Some, depending on the option, would be in a little bit of solar. And then how we build that gas would be what it is. Should it be small, fast ramping units, or should we build one big unit with some other small, fasting ramping units? That's what we're looking at right now. But either way, we got to get moving because there's some common threads in there. And you don't build a power plant overnight. It takes a, a little bit of time. Well, that is, I mean, that's, that's a part of the, you know, kind of the urgency and maybe us even having this conversation today is to let the public know um, we're moving in this direction. The integrated resource plan that you're discussing right now um, has come to the uh, Public Utility Commission or, and will be coming to council for review as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you just mentioned that you're advising us that we need to build 90 megawatts of power and, and how we do that is kind of laid out in that integrated re, uh, resource plan and, and the consultants have provided those numbers. Um, but we're talking a period of two years to go from permitting to completion of a or of a couple or one? Yeah, I would say two to three years, Mayor. I'd say between now and 2025. Of course, we're almost through 2022 as a calendar year. So you're talking two to two and a half years. And again, that's our recommendation. That's what I like about us is 
as a public power is we're looking to you all for direction to say, does this playbook look like a good plan? Right. Part of this, and I, th- there will be some Hank out there who said, well, why didn't we start this process two years ago then? Um, buying power two years ago was how much? It was much lower, Mayor. That was probably in the 40, 45 range. So you were able to buy power cheaper than you could have in building it, and then it would have been you wouldn't have seen that same kind of benefit um, two years ago. So it's again, it's some things have changed. It's become very mm-hmm. dynamic. Mm-hmm. Lots of variables associated with it. But I think we've discussed too offline just about the fact that there is more supply that's going to be coming on, and there are people around us, uh, entities around us who are building. None of which is, is you know, PNM in association with replacement of power that they're going to be losing from this, uh, from San Juan Generating Station in, in the in the meantime. Right. Um, but there is opportunity that's that's so there's light at the end of this tunnel. There is, is what I want. What I kind of want to make sure that our our customers and our community understand. You bet. And there's light at the end of the tunnel. We've had a plan. We're working on the common threads. It didn't make sense two years ago, or else we would have built right. We actually even went through bid processes and the costs we've seen compared to the purchase power prices. Boy, it looks really good now. But at the time when those decisions were made, it wasn't the right time yet. Now we're at the right time. We need to look at it and we need to execute quickly. All right. So San Juan Generating Station. Um, we're just spend a little bit of time on this because people love to know what's going on. This has been a, you know, a four four year kind of situation that we've been trying to do to what I would say from your position as the director of our utility and, and myself as the mayor is protect the assets mm-hmm. that we have built into the portion of San Juan Generating Station that we own. Mm-hmm. Uh, for our customers' information, that current currently sits at how much? How much are our unappreciated assets in that facility? You bet, Mr. Mayor. We're still at about twenty-six million of undepreciated assets we paid cash for. We would—it's like having a car and getting rid of it before you've used totally used it up, right? So, and not getting anything in return. And not getting anything in return. Because I don't believe that within the ETA bill did it say Farmington, we're going to make sure that you get a pay, you get a check no. for your physical assets that you've paid for in there, right? No, nope, nothing no. in there. And so, great opportunity. We would still love to still use it. So now we're looking at you know, the costs associated with if, if we lose, you know, the opportunity to continue to operate that power plant, which in Chan Energy mm-hmm. continues to work tirelessly on that plan. Mm-hmm. Obviously, at this point, we'd like to have been further, well, would like to have then to have been further along uh, seeing this happen, but, but things have not fallen in, in that proper order, so <laughs> no. to speak. No, they've been challenging. Um, but part of the reason why we have gone the route that we've gone to try and keep that plan operating with the carbon capture component, of, you know, with it, is that it, it does allow us to fully depreciate those assets mm-hmm. in the long term. It protects the rates that our customers would pay for power. Yep. Uh, and, and that rate would be locked in for locked almost in. 12 years, no escalation. Which I think was like $38. Mm-hmm. It's right per, at that. Per megawatt hour. So again, we're, we're talking mm-hmm. $300 plus right now to purchase a megawatt hour <laughs> off the line. We're talking $38. That's it. So it was a benefit to our customers, benefit to the utility, uh, benefit for the jobs and the economy. A benefit to CCSD and their tax base out there that surrounds that facility. Uh, these were the win-win-wins that we found and discussed at length before we went into this process to try and get, um, you know, Enchant Energy the opportunity to, to keep this plant going. And I have to think, Hank, on the side of energy security, which should be top of mind of every citizen and certainly every elected official in the state and, and in this nation, is that there is a shortage of power. And the hydropower that we purchased that you mentioned, WAPA, mm-hmm. um, that power coming from the Hoover Dam is not flowing the way that it used to flow. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we get it from Glen Canyon Dam, from okay. Lake Powell. But, and that's one piece I didn't mention. When we have the hydropower and we talk the three generation assets we control, we get firm power from the Colorado River, store, Colorado River Storage Project, or CRISP as they call it, and it comes from Lake Powell. And that is a challenge right now with lake levels. Right now, we are averaging 40% lower the generation we get. Used to be we get about eight to 9,000 megawatt hours a month. Now we're in the five to 6,000 megawatt hours per month. And there's still risk that it may go below the energy capacity or how much lake level there is for head for the turbines to shut it down. And there's risk with that, right? And they're even looking at another issue they have. They have smallmouth bass they've now found in the river below, in Colorado River below. And they're looking at things with that. And so there's a lot of variables that go on with that. So that allow cost power may go away as well, potentially. And we got a plan for that risk, so. Lots of variables going on right now. Lots of variables, Hank. Well, I appreciate um, you know the time and effort that you've 
put into this. You have you know, fantastic staff. Our linemen who are out there every single day, regardless of weather, um, they're always out, out there making sure that any outages are addressed immediately. Um, we appreciate your service and their service in that regard. I don't, I don't think it gets mentioned enough. We, we, we spend a lot of time praising our police officers and our firefighters because of the great job they do for public safety here in this community, but uh, we cannot, you know, the value of our linemen can't be undersold. Mm -mm. Those numbers we just talked about are a true credit to our linemen, our substation crews, our relay crews. It's, and when things get nasty out there, that's when they're out in the field. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hank, anything else you want to add to this conversation today that the public needs to know about? I think we covered a lot of ground there, Mr. Mayor. I think we're good. Good. So again, if, if people are interested in staying up to date with what's happening with the electric utility, social media has become our best communication tool so they can like the Farmington Electric Utility uh, Facebook page. Uh, you can also go to the Power Outage Map, which is on the City of Farmington's website. Mm -hmm. or the Farmington Electric Utility website. Is there another way to access that? Is that the fastest way? Or feel free to reach out to me if they have any detailed questions. But I think those would be the two to keep up, up to breast minute by minute. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in here today and spending time with Hank and I as we discuss uh, one of the most important topics on my mind every single day, and that's energy here in our city and abroad. Uh, we hope that you are keeping the power on in your house, and uh, we'll see you here next time on the Mayor's Table.